Good afternoon. My name is Cristiano Van Zeller. I'm um, the founder of Quinta Val Dona Maria in the Douro region, producer of Douro wines and ports. And I'm here at my home uh, in Porto to explain what the Douro is and um, talk about a little bit of history about the region itself and then um, explain the wines we produce, why we do them and talk specifically, more specifically about one or two of our wines at this moment. So uh, let us start with the region. Um, the Douro is the most historical uh, wine region uh, in the world for the fact, for the very simple fact that it was the first modern demarcated region uh, with specific rules on how to produce and what to produce and that dates from 1756. It is the region where port is produced and it is the region that started with port. Port was always the main reason for uh, the region and uh, the main wine that has been produced in the region. Um, we have, we are located uh, in the northeast part of uh, Portugal along the Douro River and uh, we have uh, in the region a multitude of terroirs. Uh, port was first mentioned as port, as a, the wine called port, in 1675 and it was due to the many um, disputes between and wars between France and England uh, in those centuries in history that port became one of the most important wines in, uh, in the consumption and developed in, in Europe. And this is because the English merchants uh, in the impossibility of uh, searching and sourcing um, French wines at certain moments looked for their oldest ally, Portugal, for wines that would replace what they were at the time bringing from France. And they soon discovered this incredible region hidden in the center north of Portugal, in, inland, where in the mountain, big deep mountain valley, where wines were being produced for, for centuries, for millenniums in fact, and um, that had the character, the strength, the power that was so much appreciated on, in, in England. In 1756, our Prime Minister decided it was time to create some rules to protect the wine, thus create and protect the production and protect the market and protect the producers. And so the first rules, official rules for a wine producing region were created. Um, we have an extensive uh, 250,000 hectares of land, but only l just less than one fifth, less than 20%, 43,000 hectares are planted under vines. The mountain valleys of the, of the Douro, carved by the Douro River, um, has been um, evolving in time, but it has maintained the, the few main characteristics. Soil is very unique along the whole region. It's schist, uh, slate, um, it's uh, climate. The climate has three different uh, variations. Closer to the beginning of the region, going from west to east, from the sea inland, we have a more Atlantic Mediterranean climate with more rain and uh, the, uh, the lowest average temperature. In the center of the region, what we call Sima Corvo, we have a very Mediterranean, slightly continental climate, drier and uh, with a little bit more heat. And in the eastern part of the, um, of the region, we have a much more continental climate, much drier, um, 400 millimeters of rain a year, which is uh, a desert, semi-desert is 200 millimeters, so it's, it's really dry and temperatures are really um, going up. We say that we have three months of summer and nine months of winter. We basically have low temperatures in winter, rain uh, during those, those months, 
and uh, temperatures range between minus 5 and 5 Celsius, positive Celsius. But in summer we can reach temperatures of um, desert-like. I remember in 2003 in our home we rec recorded 51 degrees Celsius in, in that specific year, which was uh, a record. Um, too much of a record, I must say. Um, we have many different grape varieties um, in the region. Not only the climate and the soils and the sub-regions uh, maintain and create an enormous diversity um, of climates and uh, small terroirs in the region. Um, we also have um, an enormous array of variety, grape varieties that we have planted throughout centuries. 64 red, 48 white different grape varieties create an amazing opportunity for the region and for us producers to produce and to create wines of uniqueness and wines that can be and, and um, cover a wide range of possibilities. Uh, some of these grape varieties for white, um, we have a few that some names might sound something to you, uh, but we use different names. So, Gouveio, Viozinho, Rabigato, uh, Samarinho, Arinto, uh, Malvasia, some whites, just to mention a few of the whites. Uh, Toriga Nacional, Toriga Franca, Tinta Roriz, Tinta Barroca, Tinta Roriz being the Spanish Tempranillo, Tinta Francisca, Solzão, Alvarelhão, um, and uh, so many others in red. This enormous confusion um, between brackets of, of grape varieties, of diversity of grape varieties, create an enormous opportunity for us to every year produce wines of uh, great um, complexity, but also wines that are unique. Um, we have ports and wine. The region now producing port, as always, but is also producing wine. And um, you can see now on um, this little chart some of the characters of the some of the varieties that I've mentioned and they are very specified, I'm not going to directly go and mention all of them. But you can see that just with a very few of those grape varieties that we have planted in the region, we have this enormous diversity of flavors, of, uh, <coughs> of aromas, and of, of um, tastes also that create what is port and what is now Dura wine. I'm just going to uh, go a little bit back on what I, uh, what I was telling about history, but going back to the difference between port and Douro wine. In history, Portugal or the Douro produced port. Port is a fortified wine, meaning um, sometime in history um, uh, the producers discovered that by interrupting the fermentation by adding grape brandy, it would be possible to create a wine with great stability and enormous longevity in through wines that will travel very well and wines that will age very well also for a very long time. Um, just to give you some ideas, we can easily taste from casks still wines of the 19th century from the 1860, 1870 and a few years, a few other years. And some, all these wines are still aged in cask and one day ready to be bottled um, uh, for, for to be to be put on the market, but uh, not until the 1990s of the 20th century, so nearly 230 um, years after the creation of the first demarcated region um, uh, for port, um, the Douro denomination (DOC), the dry wines, has um, have uh, started to have. Uh, a place in history. The Douro DOC, Douro Demarcated Region, as dry wine was only created and officialized in 1982. So right only nearly 40 years ago. The other one was 200 and nearly 240 years, to nearly 250 years ago. So there is a big difference in time and history on how we're producing wines. And the last 40 years, there's been an enormous revolution 
uh, created by us producers in transforming the same grape varieties, not only in great wine, which is port, but also in great dry wine, which are the Douro um, DOC wines, the dry wines that we are producing. Forty years ago, this division did not exist. Nowadays, port represents 60% of total sales of the region, and wine already represents 40% of the sales um, and production of the whole region, which is an enormous uh, success and tremendous effort that the region uh, has got undergone in these past years. And that, the challenge that we had, we all had, was we would be able, would we be able to have created out of um, the same grape varieties another great wine? We are probably the only region in the world that out of exactly the same grapes. Imagine a bunch of grapes where you cut this bunch into two. One goes and produces port because you add the brandy at a certain moment during the fermentation. The other you let ferment until the end, until it's completely dry, and you create a dry wine, Douro DOC, the Douro wines. And um, in the last 40 years, we would have been able um, to, as, as producers and the, as region, to create a wine and a name for our wines as good as, at the very high level uh, um, of quality and rec international recognition. So the region has two very important aspects to it. My family has been in business uh, in the Douro even before port was called port. Um, it's over 400 years, 400 years that we've done that. And uh, through different businesses, in 1996, my wife Joanna and I um, bought uh, from her family a small property called Quinta Val Dona Maria. And uh, from that property, we created a new brand in since 1996 and a new, and a new company. Um, we um, started with a small amount of wine. The first harvest was 1996. Uh, with 2,000 bottles, tiny, and then nowadays, and we started with 10 hectares. Now we are part of, uh, since uh, 2017, uh, we are part of the of a company called Avleda, who, which belongs to uh, some cousins of mine, the Gerdish family, and uh, we joined together, we, we joined forces, and we are now working uh, together to present our wines to the world in a much stronger position. Um, in, in 2017, we already had nearly f 40 hectares of vineyards, some 30 something hectares of vineyards. Um, and uh, with uh, joining the f when we joined of leather in 2017, we added another property. Um, this time in the Douro Superior, which is the most eastern part of the region of the Douro, we added another property, another 42 hectares. So nowadays we have very close to 75 hectares of, of uh, vineyards um, in the region and um, covering a wide uh, and a very big array of uh, wines, grape varieties, terroirs, soils um, and climates. We, um, in, in these uh, all these hec acreage uh, that we have planted, we have 41, we have identified already 41 different uh, red grape varieties in our own vineyards. And from there, it's where uh, the center, it's where we first made um, our first wine in 2000 and, um, and, and in 1996, I'm sorry. This wine came from the center of the property and it was the only wine of Quinta Val Dona Maria, the only Douro wine for a, a long time. It was called, um, and it is called Quinta Val Dona Maria, which we have here, uh, one of these four bottles. The second one from your left, uh, from my right to the left, the second bottle, Quinta Val Dona Maria, which comes from exactly the center of the, um, the, the Quinta with 41 different grape varieties of a very old vineyard uh, planted uh, over 70 years ago, uh, where all mixed planted in the field, uh, where we produce this wine. And how do we produce our wines? We still, 
um, we produce uh, the ports and, and the reds, but we moved later on in time, um, in, in the years 2006, 2007, exp with some production of white wines. And we've gone to a different area of the Douro, and uh, where we buy some grapes and we have agreements with different farmers from whom we source these, these grapes and we make uh, a few white wines um, in the region. And how do we make the whites, how we make reds and how we make the ports? Well, you have a very, I, I, I haven't done, it's not me who have done this, these um, beautiful drawings um, because if I, if I even have tried to do that you'd be turning it off because it would be such a horrible thing uh, that we wouldn't be getting anywhere. But um, here I'm sure you can understand what happens uh, with, um, with how we make the wines. We pick the grapes. All our grapes are hand-picked, 100%. Whatever the wine, the, the, the final wine we destined the grapes to, Every single grape, every single bunch is pick, hand-picked. Um, we then, for whites, we crush slightly, just destalk, and sometimes we don't even do that, um, the grapes. We put it into a press, very, very fine pressing. It's hardly pressed. It's only the very fine and deli most delicate juice coming naturally out of the grapes when you start opening the, the skins of the grapes that goes into a small stainless steel for uh, 24 hours of maceration and uh, then straight into cask where it ferments and ages uh, through a few months, normally nine to ten months of, of, um, uh, during, of, of aging, fermentation and aging. These wines uh, we do from the Douro Superior, from our, our other property we called uh, Vinhas do Sabor and we have a single vineyard, uh, Douro White, called Vinha de Martin, Quinta Val Dona Maria Vinha de Martin, uh, which is from a very, very single, very old vineyard uh, with just over a hectare, uh, producing roughly 2,000 bottles of very fine and delicate wine. Um, how do we do our reds? Um, we do the same. We pick the grapes by hand, and then we slightly crush them and we put them not in a crusher or a tank um, but we put them into lagars. What are lagars? Lagars are open granite tanks and these open granite tanks that take in our case about 4,000 kilos, 5,000 kilos of grapes we um, are very open, very shallow um, we ferment, we crush and ferment our grapes. The first crushing is done by foot. And why we use the human foot, not by tradition or because it's folklore or because it's, it looks nice to talk about tradition and so on, but because we've, we haven't found a robot that does the work as perfectly and as smoothly and as intensely as the human foot. Um, and, um, but this is the way we make the best wine. We, the crushing is perfect, the human foot is strong and soft at the same time, it doesn't crush the pips and it does a gentle rhythm of extraction for the first four hours. We use human foot, human legs and human beings crushing the grapes by foot to produce our, our reds. After these first four hours the, the wines stay in these open tanks for uh, a few days during the fermentation then just for mixing the, the skins and the juice which is part of the process of making red wine during the fermentation we already use a mechanical process, a robot that does that work because it's only a soft mixing, you don't need to crush anything you just need to mix gently the skins and the juice uh, during the fermentation and get them together uh, throughout the, that, that transformation and um, after that we either pass it to stainless steel to finish the fermentation or we finish the fermentation in the open tanks. Depends very much on the vintage, on the parcel uh, that we are crushing at the, or we are fermenting at that time. It's an in loco, in situ um, uh, decision. 
we pass it on for three, four days into a stainless steel after pressing the last uh, skins and everything into um, a stainless steel vat. It stays there just to stabilize and let the most solid deposit and then we move the, 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 the wine into cask. We use for wine, for the, both for the whites and for the reds, we use French oak. Um, depending on which wine we're talking about, we use new in different percentage, new French oak in different percentage, or one or two year old um, French oak, depending on the vintage and depending on the wine we're using. Um, and then it ages, our reds normally age in cask for about 22, 20, 22 months before being bottled and being uh, offered to the market. We Normally we offer our red wines um, two years after the harvest. Uh, so we'll, we're now selling 2017. Uh, we'll be offering at the end of the year 2018 reds, for instance. Um, we, um, how we make port? Well, you've seen uh, or, or you've heard me explain how we make red. We make the port very much at the beginning, very much in the same way. With one small exception, right at the beginning, is that we do not distort. We no, do not take away the stalks of the grapes, which we do in the red wine. We distort all the grapes. In ports, we don't distort. We just let all the stalks go in. But we do the same, the crushing, the foot treading, the lagar fermentation. But we don't let it go dry. We stop the fermentation by adding brandy at a certain moment to keep the natural sweetness, some natural sweetness, um, of the natural sugars of the grapes um, and once we put the brandy in um, the fermentation stops. We raise the alcohol level to over 18 to between 19 and 20 percent and that kills all the yeasts and stops completely the fermentation. We then mix it very well just to homogenize the brandy with everything. Normally we do that on the skins which gives it a very important and very uh, in uh, interesting, I would say, um, extraction, extra extraction of the color of the skins, etc. And then we move the wines into stainless steel for a very brief period just before we put it into two styles of, of, of casks or of wood vats. We use bigger wood vats, uh, which we call tunnel for um, the round one, or uh, cuba for a balseiro for the tall ones and for the wines that we are going to bottle at a very young stage, for the ports we're going to bottle at a very young stage, the ruby ports, LBV, vintage port, which one we have here, we produce ruby port, we produce LBV, we produce vintage port, we produce a reserve ruby port, um, but we also produce some tonnies and tonnies are those ports that age in cask all their lives and transform their beautiful red color. This is a red wine, but um, it doesn't matter. But they transform this beautiful red color through time and through oxidation in cask into a tawny-like, uh, uh, orangey. Uh, they lose this red intensity and they transform into an orangey color um, and uh, produce what we call tawny ports. 10-year-old, 20-year-old, 30-year-old, 40-year-old, single harvest. Um, and these ports can age in cask for as long as we are uh, not selling them, or as long as we are not drinking them, or as long as we look after them. And um, as I said before, we still have wines of the 19th century in cask, so um, these wines are still since the 19th century in cask and ready to be bottled at any time and to be appreciated on the markets, on the different markets. Um, now. I'm going to move on to mm. lovely color. This is red wine. It's time for a for a good drink, so it's a good start of the evening um, and the afternoon. And um, when we taste when we produce, what we're we looking for in red wine, and what are we looking for in the wines we produce, be it port, be it the red wine. Um, we look for elegance. 
we look for diversity of flavors, intensity of flavors. We, this combination of many grape varieties that we have um, makes it so interesting that every single sip, every single sniff, um, makes it, gives it, it's a new discovery, a new discovery of a new flavor, a new discovery of a new taste, um, of something new. And not only this evolves with time in the bottle, it evolves with time in the glass. What I'm tasting now, it will be different. It will be another experience, another great experience in 10 or half an hour. Um, but that same thing happens with evolution in bottle. And that same thing happens with the different vintages, with so many different grape varieties that we ferment all together and put it all together in the same fields. And these very old vineyards, even the younger vineyards that we plant the same way, um, we are discovering new things every single vintage. And it's this incredible um, uh, discover permanent discovery that makes our life in terms of wine producers so interesting. We hardly make exactly the same thing every year. Um, but that's good. It's not a, a bad thing. On the contrary, it gives us um, a challenge for every single year and every single moment to get it right. Singularity. Who is crazy enough to plant 41 different grape varieties in, in those percentages, in one specific field, with those characteristics in that specific place? So the Douro as a region and each property, you can reduce it to a small, let me put it, uh, something, another region more similar, uh, not in soil or climate or wines or anything, but in terms of how we look into it, like Burgundy. Every little corner in Burgundy is a new soil, is a new terroir, has new characteristics. And you're talking of one grape variety for red and one grape variety for white. Now, if you multiply this diversity that we have also in the Douro by these many grape varieties that I've talked to you about, 64 red and 48 whites, how, many, how much complexity can you get out of all this extraordinary place, which is the Douro? And this diversity, this permanent discovery, is something that creates wines of an incredible uniqueness, unique wines every single vintage, every single moment that we are producing. So when we develop um, our Quinta Val Dona Maria wines, we looked for the expression of each little parcel, each little place of our property. Each parcel, we've divided the property in the 32 hectares and the other hectares in the other property in small parcels, and each parcel is fermented completely uh, uh, alone. And so we are able to either blend these parcels for producing a wine like Rufo, the one I'm going to talk to you about in the end with more detail, or we can just leave these parcels alone and bottle them alone. And that's what we do with Quinta Val Dona Maria, our single vineyard wines, Quinta Val Dona Maria, uh, Quinta Val Dona Maria Vinha da Francisca, Quinta Val Dona Maria Vinha do Rio, uh, the, uh, the white uh, Quinta Val Dona Maria Vinha de Martin, and um, a couple of other single vineyards that will be coming out uh, in the future. And so we are able to do either a blend of the different areas or keep this uniqueness of terroir in our, in our, in our uh, bottle. And this is what we do in our whole range of wines. Um, now, let me talk to you about the beginning. Rufo, the Val Dona Maria Rufo, was not the first wine. But uh, it is, I call it the beginning. The idea of the name Rufo, why Rufo? Rufo means red in Latin. But it, the idea came when I was sitting with a, a friend after uh, we like hunting birds, partridges, the Iberian partridge, red leg partridge. And the red leg partridge, um, the scientific name is Alectoris rufa, meaning red feather. And we were just drinking a good glass of wine in the evening after a day walk in the fields in the mountains and searching for those partridges. By the way, we didn't get any that day. 
um, we, we were using and suddenly I said, well, I'm thinking of a name for a wine, but I couldn't find the name yet. And he said, why don't you call it Rufa or Alectoris Rufa? And that clicked. And um, soon it was easy to understand that there was something to it, to the name. It is easy to pronounce, but it had something to do with what we had been doing in the fields, which is part of intrinsic part of the Doro. Rufo means red in Latin. Uh, so it was easy for a red wine to have a name that means red. Um, and um, then I wanted to find a symbol for this wine. And um, the, the, the drum came immediately to mind. And why? Because rufar is the sound of the drum. It's what we in Portuguese we call the sound of the drum. The, brr, the sound of the drum is rufar. And rufo is also what in the north um, local people call to the drum that does that sound. It's not the beat sound, but the uh, brr sound of the drum. And so, but the, there was also some other symbolic meaning for the drum. First of all, percussion is the beginning of music. It's also what sets the rhythm. And so, by putting the drum on the bottle, we are setting the rhythm in this wine, which is the first step uh, for all the wines that we produce. It's setting the rhythm for the rest. It's the wine with uh, only two grape varieties, Torriga Franca and Torriga Nacional. So it's the most simple blend we decided to produce. We only produce blended wines. Um, the simple blend that we decided to produce. But it's also the, the ones with the two grape varieties that are most expressive in the Douro. Torriga Franca is my favorite of all the 64 reds that we have. And it gives the freshness and the flowers and the violets and this meaty feeling of incredible red wine. At the same time, it's gentle and elegant and, and smooth tannins. And we can actually, with this wine, introduce you all to the incredible expression of the Doro. And also I remembered that the drum used to give the commands in, in the old armies. So now that we are in much more peaceful times um, in terms of uh, yeah. fighting between uh, human beings, um, we, the drum, instead of just calling to arms, is now somehow calling to wine, calling to conviviality, calling for people to get together around a glass of wine. And this is what we looked into our Val Dona Maria Rufo as the beginning of a very complex and um, important range of wines and ports. And here you have it in front of you. Um, we produce a Rufo white we extended the same concept to the to to a, uh, the Rufo Red, and we extended the same concept to Rufo White. Then, because when we uh, now that we are together and uh, we are part of, of Quinta da Avelada, and we have this property in the Douro Superior, we call Douro Superior to that most eastern part of the Douro region, in the closer to the Spanish border. Um, it's um, the higher grounds. Um, and the Douro Superior, we have a beautiful property there, which produces incredible wines, and it's a great base. So we basically introduced a range of wines from that uh, area. Uh, some of them come 100% from our own vineyards and from our own wines, from our own grapes. Um, and we call Douro Superior. We have the uh, Quinta Val Dona Maria Douro Superior, we, uh, Val Dona Maria Douro Superior, we have Val Dona Maria Vinhas do Sabor, which is much more focused into the area where our property is, uh, white and red, and then we'll later on we'll be probably launching another wine from that property. And then we have from the centerpiece of Quinta Val Dona Maria, um, the property that is called Quinta Val Dona Maria, we have a range of single vineyard wines, those little parcels those different parcels that compose the whole of the Quinta Val Dona Maria, which is in the heart and the center of the center region of the Douro. And we have Quinta Val Dona Maria, um, which is the first wine that we ever produced 
um, in, in, the, in the property, from the center of the property and the old vineyards of the property. Vinha da Francisca, which is a vineyard that I planted when my daughter Francisca turned 18 back in 2004. I've now told you how old she is, um, if you make the maths. Um, and uh, which um, I promised her that I would plant a vineyard for her uh, with under her name. And so I did, Vinha da Francisca, planted with five different grape varieties. Then Vinha do Rio, which is the river vineyard, the one closer to the little stream that we have uh, crossing our property at Quinta Val Dona Maria, which is the oldest part of the property and the oldest vineyard of the property. Uh, Vinha de Martin, which is a single vineyard white, a very small hectare of white grape varieties that we have in another area of the Douro. And then, of course, the vintage, the, the ports, where the king of ports, vintage port, commands the troops, followed by the reserve port and our late bottle vintage port, and to which we already added um, last year, for the first time, a tony, a single harvest tony, a colleita, and we started last year with the 1969, uh, which is a fantastic way to start these very old ports that aging cask all their lives. Now, what to pair it with? Um, this is question of imagination. There's only two or three indications here. Um, for Rufo and for this kind of wine, there's for wine for wine pairing the best thing to do is try it yourselves try with your best food try with different foods it's an experience and it's a great experience and a great discovery as much possibilities as there are these are three there's an infinite possibilities of how to use wines all wines of the world with different foods and you'll be um, surprised how incredible combinations you can get with different wines and some of which you might not even think would work, and in the end, um, if well tried and experienced, they work. And um, so cheeses, um, uh, I'm not exactly like my brother, who once received uh, a t-shirt from a, a, a girlfriend that said, I like girls, but I love cheese. I'm not that fanatic about cheese, um, but um, I won't say about the rest. Um, but um, this cheese is subtly a great combination for uh, our, our, our Rufo and for all our wines, but specifically for our Rufo Red. And um, some pasta dishes, why not? Um, I like good pasta, uh, some, some with carbonara, some, well, you know, just pasta is very flexible because you can put, make pasta, all sorts of different pasta, and then you can add whatever you like in different ways and different flavors and, and so you can experiment anything it's a great base different pastas in the great base i prefer fresh pasta than than uh, the non-fresh but but that's a preference and of course why not barbecue good barbecue red meat um, and game any sort of game um, well it all rufo started after a, a try searching for game for birds, for wild birds. So game and good um, barbecue is a fantastic combination for, for our wines too. But the best combination of all is in fact, and without any doubt, good company. And in these moments, this is the best thing you can do with a glass of wine, is when the time comes again, and it will come soon, share it with someone you like, with your friends, with your family, and this is the best combination possible for a great wine. Cheers. So do we have time for some questions, Cristiano? Yes, time for some questions. We have some, some viewers from Switzerland and from Canada. So well. if you like to say cheers to them. <laughs> hello Canada, hello Switzerland. <laughs> uh, we have a few questions. What's your favorite grape variety in the Douro? And what is the better one for you for port? Hmm. Well, the most, the grape variety I'm most fanatic about uh, for its capacity to, um, to adapt and to give us 
a great base is Toriga Franca. Toriga Francesa, what it was called for, for, for decades or centuries, uh, what we now call Toriga Franca, which is the base of Vahufu, by the way. Um, that's, for me, the most incredible grape variety. But in the Douro, it's difficult to say which is the one that gives the best for a different wine, for a certain wine. It varies so much. It depends so much where it is planted. Um, Tinta Barroca, for instance. Tinta Barroca is a grape that I've tried. I've, I've been working in the business since 1981. It's been a long time now. Um, and I've done many experiments and many harvests. And um, in Tinta Barroca, for, for port, I knew it was fantastic. But for wine, I was not so sure. And I tried and tried and tried. I never got it there. But I probably tried it the, in a bad way, or I haven't got it from the right places, or I, I, I was not convinced with Tinta Bajoca. Until the day, um, and I, we knew that I, at Quinta Valdera Maria we had a beautiful parcel, probably the most incredible parcel, a very small hectare, producing two, uh, two, two thousand, fifteen hundred, two thousand, two and a half thousand bottles, depending, called Quinta Valdera Maria Vinha do Rio. It's the one we bottle under Vinha do Rio. And um, I knew there was some Barocca there, because in so many great varieties, but we decided to do um, accounting and, and see exactly what was there vine by vine. And uh, we got, for much to my surprise and to my great surprise, 40% of that incredible vineyard and that incredible wine is Tinta Barroca. 20% is Toriga Franca and there are 27 other grape varieties in one small hectare, 29 different grape varieties. But Tinta Barroca has an incredible potential. So. <laughs> Frankly, we are learning so much. Um, we know that Sauzon gives a lot of color. When I planted Vigna de Francisca, I chose grape varieties with beautiful acid near freshness. We live in a very hot country uh, in summer. That's when the grapes mature, so heat is, 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 is a fact. Um, uh, extreme heat is a fact. But I want, so I wanted freshness into that wine. And I used Sauzon, I used Toriga Franca, I used Tinta Francisca. Uh, which was planted for the first time in, in the Douro in the property of my ancestors, uh, uh, Quinta de Rorige, in the 18th century. Um, and I planted also Rufet, which is very typical of that area and very typical of Quinta Valdona Maria wines. Um, and that I, I got it. So I tried that for Vigna de Francisca and I loved the, the, res the end result. I had all these flavors in my head. Uh, for Port, Toriga Nacional, um, Don's Ligno Tinto, there's Sozão, there's so many that all together, I think it's what makes it great. It's the possibility of blending all these different grape varieties and for pot from all these different places um, of the region that uh, creates greatness. In reality, I, although I have a favorite, I doubt if I'll make um, a single varietal wine out of it. Yep. One more question. One more. Uh, when do you think the Quinta Valdona Maria 2017 will achieve its very best? And that's the last question. Will be the ready date for uh, 2017. Yes. Now, interesting. Um, I've t I had the possibility of tasting 1996, which is now 24 years old, um, about uh, a few months ago. And we still have 15 bottles of that wine. And I thought I'm going to find... Uh, 1996 was not a terrible year. It was average, big production. I thought it would be a bit diluted, but it also had good concentration. And grapes of Quinta... It was my first experience of Quinta Valdana Maria. And I said, well, <coughs> this, how long will this last? Um, the wine is now better than it was ever. It now has that extra character that it never had when it was young. So after all these vintages that I've tried and uh, made and uh, with mistakes and non-mistakes and uh, all the mistakes were not bottled, um, uh, through all these 25 vintages now um, in, at Quinta Valdona Maria and nearly 40, vintage, 40 vintages this year in the Douro, I would dare say that <coughs> Quinta, the 2017 will take to reach its peak another 10, 12, years, then it will stay in its peak for a long time. And that's my experience with Dura wines. They tend, they will increase, they will improve and gain <coughs> um, character 
and gain um, wisdom uh, like people through time and then it will stay in that peak of wisdom for a long time. How long I can say, I don't have that experience. The only wine in the Douro, there's only one wine that started, wine, not port, but wine that started in 1952 and um, sometimes we open bottles of the 1960s of those wines uh, by another producer, the Ferreira family and um, and that called Barca Velha, to, just to, to mention. Um, and some those wines are still an enormous surprise. So my experience would say that these wines will last for a very long time, 20, 30 years, perhaps even more. But that I cannot say because I, I, haven't, I haven't been here for that long with wine. Um, but 10, 12 years is when I reckon the wine will reach. But one, one very interesting fact, if you open and decant the wine, um, and I do that with very young of our wines, of our very young wines, I open a bottle, I may drink a glass, um, and then I try and leave the whole bottle for a day or two and go back to it two days later, one or two days later. And the wine is absolutely incredible. So if that 24 hours of oxidation, which doesn't happen in the bottle, um, but only when you open the bottle, is equivalent for many years and how many years that will go. And I do that experiment throughout a whole week, in fact, to see the evolution and capacity of evolution of a year. These wines, and 17 in special, especially, because it was strong, powerful, incredible, but beautiful acidity and balanced wine, it will last for many decades to come. But let's say 10, 12 until it reaches that. It's just an opinion. Well, no more questions, maybe? Uh, one more, one yeah, more. <laughs> go, go ahead. I mean. uh, why does the Doro Superior uh, 2017 uh, have a higher alcohol, 15%, than the Doro Vinho 2017? 40%, 14%. Um, that depends very much on the blends um, that we have. Um, some, uh, there is a lot of Turiga Franca and Turiga Nacional in the, in the um, uh, Doro Superior. And there are other, vin other grape varieties in the Vigne Sabor. So the, the, the grape varieties um, have evolved differently and some will have reached different levels of sugar, maturity, and um, it's what the grapes would give. Um, we don't actually look for, alcohol, for the alcohol. We pick the grapes when we think they're right, when they think they're ripe, and in the Douro in general, when they ripe, they have sugar. If they have sugar, they have alcohol. Um, it's a very dry and a very hot climate. And so it just happened. Next year could be the, a completely reverse way. Um, the year will tell, and the maturity of the grapes when we pick and the passes when we pick is what dictates the, <coughs> the, the final alcohol content of the wine. So there is no specific reason other than what nature has dictated at that moment. No more? Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your patience. I hope I've uh, brought you some information and that you thought that that was interesting. And um, be happy. Enjoy Quinta Val Dona Maria wines. And um, hope to see you soon in Switzerland and in Canada. And I look forward to traveling again like everybody else. Thank you very much and goodbye. <laughs>